this morning at Crosswind. If you got out of the rain today, I have to tell you a story. When um, I first went in the ministry, there was this little girl. She came right up to me one day. She wrote it to me. She says, you know what? You know what? She says, Jesus loves me the mostest. And what I want to tell you today, because you're out, of the, out in the rain at church today, Jesus loves you the mostest today. So I uh, hope you will enjoy the weather today, because in my rain today, and from this point forward, will be declared National Nap for all day. Uh, see how great day it is. Authority. In America, don't we 
kind of have a pushback on yelling to authority? You know, don't we kind of want to tell people, you're not the boss of me? Like we're two-year-olds, correct? And so we talked last week about submission and what Peter had to say about submission. Peter talked to us last week about how we need to submit to the government. Oh, turn on any CNN channel, there's, not a whole, there's a whole lot of arguing when it comes to the government, isn't there? We are, and we're to pray for our leaders. Catch this whether we like them or not. We're still to pray for them. We're to pray for our bosses. <laughs> our bosses, come on, all our bosses are stupid, aren't they? Yeah, can I get an amen? Yeah, a lot of us know our bosses. They don't know what they're doing. I mean, they're dumb. Hello? Him or her? Seriously? Hello? Then we're called, catch this, catch this, the person closest to us, if you're married, we're supposed to submit to our spouses. No way. Do you? No, I know. <laughs>
more people passed by, and he was moaning from the sidewalk, help me, help me. You know, we can be so cold, we can be so callous. It's like we see people and we say, never mind, and be humble. Whenever I think about the word humble, I always think about the book of Philippians, where the apostle Paul writes to us about how Jesus was humble. And we often put the words of scripture up on the screen, but this morning, I wanted you to hear this, because sometimes it's good just to hear scripture. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Isn't our attitude a little word that really makes a big difference? Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I wonder if we're willing to humble ourselves. If we're really going to be humble, sometimes we think that humble is like, oh, shucks. When somebody says something nice to us, oh, no, you know, no, no, you know, we think that's humble. No, 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 we're going to be humble. We're going to have to open our minds. We're going to have to open our minds to God's definition of what humble is. He goes on, he says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do so that you may inherit a blessing. You know what? We have a phrase in our world, don't we? It, it's paybacks, right? We even have cute little catchphrases go along with paybacks, don't we? We're going, you're going to do me wrong, guess what? I'm going to do you wrong, because paybacks are coming. And we use paybacks as an excuse for bad behavior, don't we? It's just payback. Yeah, it's just payback. God has called us to bless others so that we can inherit a blessing. And I wonder, are we willing to make up our minds do the things Peter tells us to do so that we can be of one mind? Or are we as the church just going to keep on keeping on losing our minds? Peter goes on. At this point, he's going to quote Psalm 34. And the people who heard this that were with Peter, remember, they were being persecuted. And as they, as they, as they heard this stuff and they were off, and they, were, they would recognize this scripture. And you're, he's like, you're, you mean... You're, you're going to tell me this, and I'm being persecuted, and I've been ran out of my home, and I'm suffering, and I live in this hostile environment? That sounds a little bit like our world today. There are people all around us who feel as if they're being persecuted, don't they? There are people all around us who feel like this world is a hostile environment. Turn on the 5 o'clock news. There are people in this world who are suffering in ways you can't imagine. People in this room sitting here with you right now. People who are suffering with things they're willing to share, things they're not. People who are suffering in their spirit. Suffering in silence. So Peter says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, woohoo, who wants to enjoy life? Woo, only me? I'm the only one? Okay, then. Anybody want to see happy days? Yeah, happy days? Who wants to see sad days? I don't know. Happy days. So Peter says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days. And he's talking about all the suffering that's going on around in the world. He says, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from sin and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. See, Peter is telling us how we are to be in this world, how we're to act. He's echoing the words from last week when he tells us that we are called to do good. We are called to live for what's right. We are called, that's this, we are called to be set apart. You have to ask yourself, are you any different than anybody else you know who doesn't know Christ? And that's a tough question for us sometimes. When we get out of here and we're out of church and we, you know, take off our take off our church at you know take off our church time and we go to Walmart this afternoon, we act like everybody else. Have we lost our mind? Or are we of one mind? Or we have the mind of Christ? And I wonder why we have such a hard time of being of one mind. I think there's some things that hold us up. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. He tells us. First of all, I think one thing is that a lot of times we just have closed minds. You know, some people, you've been a Christian for a long time, 
and, and you think you know everything, and you're the expert, and nobody can tell you any, anything. But God wants to take that closed mind. He wants to open it up. Some of us, in our faith journey, we're just taking our first steps. And our minds kind of close. Our minds can close even to the concept that there could be a God. God wants to open up our minds. He wants us to be in one mind and understand who Christ was. Another reason that we cannot be in one mind is sometimes our minds are just, anybody ever distracted? I bet some of you have been distracted while I've been talking the last five minutes or so. I bet, I bet, I bet you $1,000 somebody's been on Facebook. But anyway, so yeah, our minds can be distracted. Somebody else in the text message. I know it. I heard it. But, um, you know, we can be so distracted. This world has a lot of distractions in it, doesn't it? A lot of things to pull us away from the things of God, doesn't it? And we know we need to be where God wants us to be. And this world it help, causes us to lose our focus. It just sucks us in. Sometimes we just feel overwhelmed. We're distracted from that one mind that Peter's telling us about. He goes on and says, some, you know, some of us, we have insecure minds. Somewhere along the way, somebody made us feel inferior. And all our lives we've been looking. We've been looking for something to fill us up, to make us feel like we matter. And we don't put enough emphasis on the God of heaven who tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That the king is enthralled with your beauty. That God sent his son to die on the cross for you because of his love for you. And we can't walk in that. We walk in the words of people who have no business judging us. It's not the God of heaven who tells us who we are. So we can be insecure. We can think that only bad things are going to happen to us. And our lives, we can't have one mind because we're so filled with anxiety. <coughs> We're filled with fear. We're so worried about what's going to happen next. One mind, seriously? It says we should be a selfish mind. A lot of times we can have a selfish mind. Everything's all about me. You know, I used to have a friend and go to lunch with him and we'd be talking to lunch and I'd say, so how you doing? He'd, he'd ask me, he'd say, so how you doing, Suzanne? I said, I'm doing pretty good. He'd say, well, enough about you, let's talk about me. And, uh, you know, that's the way some people are. That's the way some of us are. We're so Selfish, it's all about us. Guess who the top priority in our world is? We can't be of one mind with other Christians, because guess who the top priority is? Me, 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 me. It's hard to be of one mind where everything's all about us. And then sometimes we just have unforgiving minds. You know, we've all had problems. We've all had a past. We've all experienced pain. And if you haven't, it's going to come. That's another reason why this one mind concept is so important. We can be, we can have an unforgiving mind, and we can't be the one mind. We can't be the mind of Christ that Peter's talking about for us. We have lost our mind sometimes. We have lost our way. But sometimes we get swallowed up by the suffering in this world. There's so much going on in this world. Just in the last few weeks, we've had the Boston bombing. We had the fire in Texas. We turn the news on and we remember that two years ago we had our own suffering in our community. But guess what? People all around you are having their own natural disasters in their lives every day. Many Christians that will be of one mind. You know, this concept of suffering is not one we're very comfortable with, is it? We don't like that part of the Christian journey. And yet we have to wonder that we serve a Savior, Christ, who suffered on our behalf. And I don't know where we got it that we were going to get a free pass in this world. Because we're not going to. This morning I want to share a video with you. It's a video of a teacher. And a New York Times came in to video him because he was teaching us. <coughs> you ever, anybody remember that one teacher when you were in high school who was just, or middle school, or I mean, who was just so incredible and you would never forget him? He's, Mr. Wright is that kind of teacher. And he teaches physics. New skill for me. That's some of you engineers might like it. But, you know, he teaches physics, for goodness sake. And he does crazy things. He, he makes little light things. They look like UFOs. And he puts the kids on them down the hallway. And he lets them hammer wood on his chest. And he blows things up. And, I mean, he's like, you know, the coolest teacher. Everybody wants to be in his physics class. Physics. Everybody wants to sign up for physics. Okay, so he's this incredible teacher. And they decide they're going to do a report on him. When they go to do the report on him, in the midst of the video, what you discover is there's a story within him. Some of what Peter's talking about. But how do we face 
suffering? What mind can we have during that suffering? And what lesson can we learn from Mr. Wright's Abby is perfect in every way. She's uh, actually 15, not 14. She's 15 going on 25. She's, you know, one of these people that can't stand her dad and stupid and a little bit nuts and, and so forth. So I, I, love, I love her to death. When Adam came along, though, we didn't think it was going to be a boy. And all of a sudden, a boy pops out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is cool. Now I got a girl and a boy. And not that I really cared, but you get all the dreams of, wow, I'm going to be going to football games, I'm going to be going to baseball games. If they're not any good at sports like I am, I'll be going to you know, plays or something like that. Whatever it be, yeah, I'm going to be there for my little buck, okay? <laughs> no, now we have to give her our address. So what was our address in Spanish? Mm -hmm. Uno, uno, doso, doso. <laughs> what the heck? No. Is that? Well, anyway, the nurse comes out and says, this is your boy, and I get ready to hold him. She said, we got to take him back. And I'm thinking, what's going on? She said, he's breathing really, really fast. He was breathing 180 times a minute. It's about three times a second. Still to this day, he breathes about 60 times a minute. That's once a second. Think about breathing that fast. You get pretty tired after that one. You get all your homework done? Yeah, yeah. You breathe a little better now. That help. That help right there. You get a good head of hair. Yeah. Do you like music? Love you, Mary. How do you sell music? Come on, come on, come on, man. That was sign time. How do you sell music? Okay, so that's music. Okay. We then found out he was completely blind. Yeah. Uh, he was born with something called Jobert syndrome. Only 417 people in the whole world have it. And what it is is. Uh, it's an autos uh, autosomal recessive disorder where my wife has to have a gene and I have to have a gene that puts us together and it causes this to happen. So I have a completely intelligent little boy, but he can't control what his body does, even though his body is completely functional. The mere fact that right now your butt's on that chair, your butt tells your brain which way up is. His brain doesn't do that. So the mere fact that you can sit down and sit up is a miracle. He is extremely self-abusive. Uh, for instance, um, if he gets scared or if he gets upset, he'll start picking his fist and pounding his face as much as possible. If he wakes up and he gets scared and I'm not there, he'll roll out of bed and start pounding his face on the floor. Yeah, I'm still getting bad. He's starting to constantly take his legs and just pound them on his wheelchair until it's all bruised and bloody. So when I started getting a, a rap on what all this was about, all those dreams of ever watching that, my son knock a home run over the fence went away. And talk about getting pissed at God. I was pissed. Because you know the whole thing about where the universe came from? I didn't care. What I care about is why. And you can pick on me all you want, but when you pick on my little boy, that's wrong. A totally innocent little baby and you're making him do that. And I started asking myself, what was the point of it? Playing the whole brother. I'm thinking, 
You didn't know how to play. And she said, Adam, she said, like, hand me a dollar or something, and he just smacked it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if he smacked that, he can see. When did you find out he can see? He's like, I don't know, he just starts smacking dollars. I'm thinking, holy man. And so then we started working with him and trying to teach him a little sign language. And there was nothing more incredible than the day you see this. What's that mean? Daddy, I love you. So cool. That's when I knew it didn't care about how things work anymore. It's the reason why things work is because of love. So there's something a lot greater than energy. There's something a lot greater than entropy. It's the fact that what's the greatest thing? Love. That's what makes it all the why we exist. So in that great big universe that we have with all those stars, who cares? Well, someone that cares about you a lot. As long as we care about each other, that's where we go for. Our 
empathy to try to understand what it must be like to walk in another shoe, another shoes. We read First Peter and we think, oh, those are just old, dusty people. No, they're people just like you who had families. Mr. Wright's family, so what? His family's suffering. And some of you are suffering. We're called to be sympathetic. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that storm shelter's built. Because guess what? If we don't raise the money, the rest of the money goes back to the federal government. And the next time, by the way, Yarbrough and Stovall have been hit three times in 30 years, the next time one other one comes through, how would that make us feel? We're going to be one mind. We're going to make things happen. So we're to be loving. What that means, we are to be the most inclusive people we know. We don't care what somebody looks like. We don't care that they think differently than us. We don't care that they choose to live their lives differently than us. Because guess what? Jesus died for them too. Not just for us. So we're to be inclusive. All of us, if we're going to be of one mind, we should be looking at who in our lives can we invest in. Who needs some of our time? Why are we so distracted? We need to invest in them. We need to invite them to join us. And when they get here, make room so they can come in. Include them. Step out of your comfort zone. We have to be of one mind, and it takes all of us to be of one mind. So we need to be compassionate. You know, I read a story this week of a Marine. And after the Boston bombing, he went into a hospital room. And as you recall, in the Boston Marathon, many of the people who were injured, they lost limbs. He went to this young woman's room, and she had lost both her legs from the knee down. It was the first time she had actually been to the Boston Marathon, had lived in Boston all her life. First time she had been to the marathon, she goes to watch, and she happened to be standing near the finish line. And she said, I was just thinking that I might start trying to train. She goes, but I could never really run anymore. And, uh, you know, because I, I, I don't really like to run. And the guy was talking to her from Afghanistan, and he said, I know exactly how you feel. He said, and I know that you think this is the finish line, but this is just the beginning. There's more. She looked at him, and she joked with him, and she said, well, one thing that held me back from running before was the fact that I get shin splints. She said, now I'll never get shin splints again. <laughs> <laughs> that conversation happened to somebody who had a compassion we're called to share that same compassion with others, to be in one mind. We're called to be humble. Christ gave us that example to humble ourselves, to be obedient, to put it all on the lines for other people. And I wonder, are we willing to respect others? Are we willing to value them? Are we really, will, are we really, really willing to allow others to have dignity? Yeah. Finally, we're called to be a blessing. We are called to bless others. Make no mistake about it. There are people all around you suffering. Suffering is part of life. And if we're all in one mind, we can be a blessing. There are people who are struggling with emotional needs. There are people who are struggling with physical needs. Who are sick, who are ill, who need our help. There are people struggling financially. I met a woman yesterday whose husband died, and she hasn't been able to get her VA benefits yet, and they have nothing. And all of us go home to our big houses, and we have so much more compared to anybody else in the world who lives on two dollars a day. What could we do if we could be in one mind? And people who are struggling with spiritual needs, they might look like they have everything, but on the inside, they're empty, and they even. All these things can happen if we can stand up and be the people of God and be, as Peter says, of one mind. The suffering exists. Peter's not known. He says this to us. He says, And the God of all, all, uh, God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I love this verse. Because this verse says that our God is a God of restoration. And no matter how much suffering you've been through, no matter how much you're suffering now, no matter what's coming around the bend, our God is a God of restoration. And 
He himself will restore you and make you strong. And that ought to give you peace of mind. Peter tells us all the incredible words he says to us. He says, find be of one mind. And I think that if Christians want to turn their lives around, starts right there.